discussion on looking beyond the conventional workforce strategies to attain manufacturing excellence. You know, if we look at uh, what the last couple of years has really been about, uh, it is about being uh, advanced when it comes to technology. Uh, digitalization has taken us uh, to a place where we would ideally have gone maybe in a decade when it was all about a matter of months and we had to be there. So what we really are going to talk about and focus a lot in this next segment is going to be how the manufacturing industry is really gearing up for the new normal or shall we say the next uh, way of working as it continues to face challenges when it comes to workforce safety, labor shortage, dearth of skilled workforce, upskilling workspace members and all of this. Telling us more about all these points, uh, also sharing a lot more on smarter and more effective ways of employee engagement along with learning and development needs to meet the technical demands of the future. The best practices today, both considering health and safety and so much more, is going to be our expert panelists as our television team gets all set to put this set together for our segment on looking beyond the conventional workforce strategies to attain manufacturing excellence. May I have the pleasure of inviting our speakers on stage. Please do welcome Mr. Chetan Deshpande Group, CHRO Sanjay Godawa Group. Please do put your hands together as he steps forward. May I also present to you Mr. C.S. Krishna Kumar, Senior Vice President and CHRO SR Power. A round of applause from our very kind audience as I also extend a very warm welcome to Mr. Mohit Kumar, President, HR, Head of Learning, Talent, OE and HO HR Hindalco Industries. A very warm welcome uh, to Mr. Mohit Saxena, Head Human Resources, Bajaj Energy. Please do put your hands together as I welcome Ms. Pooja Bansal, Chief Human Resources Officer, Piaggio Vehicles. May I also present to you Mr. Shailesh Vilankar, Senior Vice President, Human Resources, Shinla India. And a very warm welcome uh, chairing this panel will be Mr. Karan Karai, Editor-in-Chief, Marksman Daily. May I request for all of you to please put your hands together as all of them join us here on stage. A very, very diverse background, uh, diverse industry. So we're going to really listen in to everything that various industries and sectors feel and let me now hand over to Mr. Karai. All yours. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Isha. Uh, very good morning, all of you. Welcome to the manufacturing edition of Most Preferred Workplace 2022-2023 uh, with this very eminent panel of industry experts and leaders here with us. Uh, as you might have surmised by now, my name is Karan Karai. Uh, I'll be your guide and moderator for this panel discussion. Um, before we begin, let me try and set the scene a little bit. The manufacturing industry, as we know it, serves as the barometer of economic well-being and prosperity anywhere across the world, and it's no different in India. Uh, currently, it represents about 17% of GDP, and through a set of targeted uh, policy measures and interventions, the government is looking to take it to about 25% of GDP by 2025. Uh, this is an evolution that's playing out right before our very eyes through uh, myriad factors, such as the reduced dependence on your global supply chains, such as uh, an increased degree of localization, such as the advent of just-in-time manufacturing. These factors have combined to serve something of uh, renewed confidence in our own manufacturing capabilities, in our own R&D capabilities. And Organizations have stepped out to the plate to try and make more ventilators, more face masks, more sanitizers in a time of great change and great flux, perhaps amongst the biggest healthcare that anyone has seen in our lifetimes at least. But change is also a very uh, curious beast because it creates this sense of anxiety amongst people, amongst organizations. But there are those amongst us that use it as some kind of a rocket fuel this sense of anxiety to propel them up into the stratosphere. Uh, the good organizations, they react to this change. The better ones see it coming from a mile off and they prepare for it. Uh, the better ones ride the coattails of it and create their own kind of change momentum to soar to the moon. And we'll be trying to uncover more insights about this very facet. But even amongst this entire ingenuity that we've seen that's served as something of a competitive advantage, that's created flexibility, that's created innovation. 
the one thing that perhaps hasn't changed, or perhaps the importance of it hasn't changed, is the adherence to human values. And when I say that, it's, it's not just to your own workforce, your own employees. It's a much broader perspective which uh, goes perhaps even beyond CSR towards serving the communities that you're really deeply embedded in and giving back to the people, serving as this paragon of all that is good. So we're gonna try and uncover uh, through these leading organizations what it takes to display strength, to display resilience amongst this time of change, and together cut through that noise and uncover new ways of working in this new manufacturing workforce. Now, I don't believe we're gonna have time for a Q&A at the end of this, although I do encourage all of you to try and take your conversations offline and converse with all of our speakers over here once the panel has ended. Uh, this will be a straightforward uh, ping pong of questions to all of our panelists where we'll be chatting with them, throwing questions their way, and in the process, uh, try to serve some food for thought that will serve all of you well. And this is perhaps as good a time as any to tell you all to please put your phones on silent if you all haven't already. Uh, my first question then is uh, to you, uh, Mr. Mohit Kumar. Um, what we're seeing is that, of course, like I've touched upon, there's been a lot of change that has uh, inundated industries across the board. Um, corporate leaders, of course, don't have it easy when it comes to figuring out all of those transitions. So then, uh, how should they get started when it comes to trying to get those skills, those capabilities right? All right, so if I correctly understand, uh, when people are moving from one role to the other role, yes, yes, how they are, how yes, we are how enabling them. Correct, correct. So uh, transitions are happening at different levels, right? Uh, we are a growing organization. Right? Uh, so one transition will be for so to be CXOs, right? Um, and we have some of them sitting over here in this room also. So what will be required to be supported for them? So we have crafted a program for them, which is an 18 months program. Uh, technical skills, functional skills, people leadership, that's all kind of given for this set of people. What is required is even subtler skills, right? Uh, in terms of uh, deep listening, in terms of feeling the feelings, in terms of deeper skills for coaching people, right? And that is something which is uh, an experiential journey. Right? Uh, it can't be taught in the classrooms. It has to be experienced. It has to be experienced in the playground. So that's the, and a playground is the, uh, the office environment, right? How well we are playing with our uh, team. What's the culture that we are facilitating? And deeper skills, we come back for clinicking. That is, what went well, what can further improve? So that's a two years program for the two BCXOs. Then we have programs for, say, people who are going to be uh, PNL leaders. What kind of exposure, national and global? Uh, what kind of uh, people leadership? What kind of business leadership that they'll be requiring? We also have then programs for functional leadership, which is a different kind of uh, uh, programs. So leadership is at every level. So basically, if we have to help people in transition, we have to help them before they make the transition. That is around two years or four and a half years in advance. We have programs at every, every level, and that from campus to first-time managers, from first-time managers to the people who are becoming managers of manager, then function heads, PNL leaders, and the, C and the CXOs, right? And uh, even after transition, we do support them uh, with transition coaches. We heavily believe in coaching. Uh, that works as a support system that a person who is experiencing a new geography, new business, new team, he has somebody to bounce off that how he's feeling, right? Uh, it, it may be you know, difficult at that level. You, when you're senior, you're lonely. So uh, there's a coach who's supporting you, who's a transition partner in that journey. I hope I gave you some. Absolutely, it's a very uh, pertinent point you raise because at the end of the day, everything boils down to people, really. Uh, they're the most important, one of the most important cogs at any rate in the organizational wheel. Uh, let me try and lob this question uh, to you, Pooja. Uh, we had a very uh, fascinating discussion, uh, free flowing uh, off the stage when we were just sitting around and chatting and we were talking about diversity, we were talking about trying to create this new normal that we're heading towards. Um, technology is, of course, uh, day ago when it comes to these kind of discussions, but I, I firmly believe that it comes down to people, bottom line. So then, um, Drawing from your experiences where you talked about trying to create this more diverse workforce at Piaggio, um, how can you continue to do things better uh, in this new uh, reality that we are seeing emerging before us? All right. Um, 
So I come from this hardcore automobile organization. And throughout my 18 years of experience, I've al always worked with manufacturing. Um, you know, I've heard a lot in the previous panel, and uh, I did see that, yes, women are conditioned a little differently, and we do come sometimes, it's a social influence that plays a larger role. So I come from, an uh, from a family which, uh, I, I guess I was lucky that they encouraged me to actually be on the shop floor. My first job was on the shop floor, and that was 18 years back when I was an MBA graduate. I'm also a Wharton student. Uh, coming from Mumbai, born and brought up there, but my first job was in a remote area on the shop floor. So I can very well empathize as to what diverse workforce is, right? Going back then, the diversity was much low. Now, um, now if we have to encourage, or if we really want diversity, I think even World Economic Forum is talking about a lot of core skills. And the top three core skills that they're talking about is creativity, emotional intelligence, and uh, people management skills. So if you want to do this, it has to be across levels. So it has to be right from the shop floor till the CXO level. And that's what we are trying to do in Piaggio. So we're not only doing a lot of reskilling and upskilling, but we are also ensuring that the core skills that humans are known for, though we are all moving to automation, and it's not never going to be that machines are going to replace humans. It's only the skills that might change. So what humans really are good, which is creativity, problem solving, people management, and that's not what machines can do. That's gonna be very, very specific to humans. And that's what we try to instill. And again, repeating, it's not just gonna be limited to the CXOs. It has to start right from the bottom line on the shop floor, and then it moves ladder up to ladder, and then goes up to the CXO level. So if you want a culture to be created where you have uh, integrated workforce, and you have the future skills, which is the skills, the people soft skills, which machines will never be able to replace, I think it's important that we focus on those skills across levels, and that's what we do at Piaggio. Thank you, thank you, Pooja. Um, I, I do fully agree with you that that's what it comes down to, end of the day. Um, emotional intelligence in terms of your, your critical thinking, your empathy, your decision making, these are skills that cannot be trained. It's very, you can actually train it, but it's not entirely easy to train it. Um, I wanted to bring you uh, into the discussion, uh, Mr. Kumar, uh, Mr. Saxena, sorry. Two Mohits on the panel. Things can get a little confusing sometimes. Uh, to you, Mr. Saxena, I wanted to um, touch upon this whole aspect, you know, where Pooja was talking about uh, the importance of trying to be more aware of the soft skills. Um, what this also means then is that down the line, you know, you've got to have managers, not just leaders, actually correctly alluded to, who need to be in tune with not just the functional needs of the people on their team, but also the more emotional, softer aspects. Uh, how do you take care of these two uh, aspects, really? Yeah. So I'd like to share my perspective on this uh, question which you put across. If you today look at all the manufacturing organizations in today's context, you are actually working with uh, generations which are spanning across probably decades. You have the Generation X, you have the Millennials, you have the Gen Z. So you have different kinds of people and Everyone has a set temperament. So you have people who are very focused, very conventional, very hardworking, want to do things the structured way. You have the youngsters and the millennials who probably are too tech savvy, want to just go ahead with things on a fast pace. And when you're dealing with such diverse workforce, the biggest challenge which remains between teams to work cohesively is the relationships, interpersonal relationships which actually affect between them. So as an organization, it's very important for us to understand that when you have this diverse work groups working together, how do you bridge the gap between these two generations? How do you sensitize them towards each other? How do, how do you create that sense of community amongst those fellow professionals who have such a varied experience gap and expectation mindset between them? I'll give you a classic example of our organization in Bajaj. Here, this is an organization which has been running since I think decades, it's completing a century in coming years now. So an organization which has leadership where five decades of generations have worked together. So you will find leaders who are actually the typical old school thought who would speak with sir and you have the young guys coming in who just want to 
get to the westernized culture of going by the first names. What do we actually do? So this is where we actually thought that you need to create that complete transition between these two generations. And we actually created one intervention where we said that you need to look at that new generation and groom them into the new culture, into the culture of the organization. So we created a very uh, comprehensive program with a mix of all the key leaders and their identified successors who happen to be from the millennials and the Gen Z. Now this program actually focused upon speaking about the softer aspects of leadership. We spoke about all the behavioral traits when, which encompass empathy, which encompass your managerial effectiveness, which actually bring in the human element. And then there were two things which were really required. What we hear every time and how do you look at it in the practical context? Learning and unlearning. There was unlearning which was required to be done at the senior level. There was learning which was required to be done at the younger level. So a blend of both that things, both of them working together in classrooms, discussing scenarios, discussing situations out, made them realize some of the senior most people came back and said, I think we needed to understand that as a manager, I didn't really need to know the answers to all the questions. I just needed to listen. And that is something I'm learning today. So this kind of a culture which you actually create in an organization by focusing on the soft skills, by trying to see that what is a pro and a con of a situation from the perspective of the other individual actually gives them a very good alignment to people to work cohesively in the team. And that is why I actually feel that in this organization, I've pe seen people, they have a very high level of loyalty and commitment towards the organization. They, they get a sense of family working in this organization. Though I've just been two years old in the organization, but when I see the whole company, it gives that sense of accomplishment, both to the youngsters and to the seniors. Added to it, I'll give you a very interesting dimension. Post the COVID era, the pre and post COVID era, and the scenario which is there in the industry. The average attrition across the manufacturing industry has been somewhere about, I think 14, 15, 16%. To my surprise, the attrition in this industry in our business till date today has been 5%. Can you believe that? And you have the youngsters, people from good colleges and campuses, and the seniors gelling well together. So it's all about that fusion which you need to create. It's all about understanding each other, creating that culture of a feeling of uh, being as one community, which makes the whole difference in driving the organization. Thank That's you. a very valid point you raised, more when you talked about the importance of listening, because I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard over the past few years, uh, the face of somebody saying that I don't feel seen or I don't feel heard. That's something that matters perhaps more than anything else, maybe more than a rewards and recognition program or anything else. Um, let me uh, pass the question on to you, uh, Chetan. I, uh, Employees today, millennials today, any generation really, all they want to do is try to feel connected, find a greater sense of purpose in what they're doing, more meaningfulness. How do you create that kind of uh, stickiness, that uh, engagement, so to speak? Good afternoon, Viruyan. I hope you are all having fun. Uh, Karan, I think uh, this actually goes back to the roots of how we uh, structure positions in education industry. You know. Uh, manufacturing, as you rightly mentioned, uh, contributes 15% to GDP, and now they are 16%, now planning to go for 25%. But when you ask a layman, probably it doesn't hit him. You know, such is the industry, the manufacturing. And when you go back to our uh, you know, study roots, uh, they call this as a, a stream called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, right? Uh, somehow, the manufacturing industry hasn't got that glamour attached to uh, when it comes to pursuing it as a career. Now, most of the people who do STEM, uh, I think only about 50% of them actually make manufacturing as a career. Like when I heard Pooja saying she's never worked anywhere other than manufacturing, I mean, that's, that's music, right? I mean, it, it starts from making the, the manufacturing industry a little more appealing to this Gen Z start from there. Now, uh, when we go to our manufacturing industry, invariably most of the manufacturing setups are actually part of an organization. 
and I have seen with my experience it's three sets of organizations. One is a manufacturing organization, second there is a corporate organization, and then there is a sales organization. All of that together makes a enterprise. So one of the root causes I feel that from an organization perspective they have kept it separate. So how do we make sure that we integrate all these three organizations? So when an when a Gen Z guy comes to work for manufacturing, he sees that as a career for him, not just stuck to a, a shop floor. So organization which create a career with an architecture for him that you join here, you don't need to look anywhere outside. You join at a shop floor, you do a job in corporate, you uh, have a stint at sales, and come back as a head in manufacturing. So something like that will really uh, uh, set uh, and many organizations are already doing. Many uh, corporates are making sure that when people join manufacturing and they make it as a career, second part. Third part is also we need to understand, I think Mohit brought a very important point, Gen Z workers, right? I mean, boomers are retiring, we are all millionaires, so we are probably at a, a job which doesn't have a direct connect at shop floor. So, Gen Z, what attracts them, you know, technology. Uh, everybody talked about artificial intelligence. Just to add a humor, I have this favorite line about artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence can never beat natural stupidity. Right? So, uh, but on a serious note, um, I think how do we ensure that the artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that happen happening, and we talk about industry 4.0, industry 5.0, all of that is appealing to outside world. You know, there is a little bit of a social media uh, usage required there. So that's another element where people outside the uh, industry are attracted to this and make this as a career and there is technology to dab with for them. Uh, though they don't need to go to an IT sector or a service sector. So there's a lot here and everybody says manufacturing is the mother industry. So how do we make it? glamorous from outside. From inside, from a culture perspective, you know, uh, you know how do we, post pandemic it has already got us a lot of things. So how do we ensure that people learn, upskill themselves and keep up to the space and especially industries like automotive, the core manufacturing industries, how do they keep on upgrading themselves is a, is a challenge that every organization needs to take up. The second element is also uh, very sensitive and uh, uh, also important is how do we ensure that the pay grades are better uh, in manufacturing industry. So there is obviously a, uh, a top line and an EBITDA driven and that drives the compensation. But that's an element to look at. The third element is, you know, the sense of belonging where they love the job. Uh, and that can come from everything. That can come from policies. To, and uh, I mentioned about those three, uh, you know, groups in any company the manufacturing, the sales, and the corporate, how do you ensure the parity amongst all from a culture perspective? You know, I have seen organization where corporate has got a fantastic office, jazzy with all the you know, benefits and the plant looks a little different. So parity at that level also will give a, a lot of sense of belonging, you know, whether it is your community, whether it is your policies that you do. So I think combined with right from STEM at a society level, to attracting from outside, to giving them a career and a long term, helping them build their uh, skills on the way, and also bringing that parity where they don't feel like in manufacturing I'm deprived of anything because they are not actually. It, it's a fabulous industry to be in, and uh, the, the numbers speak for themselves. So, so multi-pronged approach, uh, people like us in this uh, boardroom going back, thinking about it, how do you ensure that uh, by the way, that 25% uh, GDP contribution would mean 100 million jobs coming to get there and in manufacturing. So how do we get talent? So all, all need to look at these aspects and if we get it together, our act, hopefully we should get there. That number is actually a very uh, humbling one when you think of the scale of it, 100 million jobs uh, targeted by 2025, purely by manufacturing alone. Um, we've seen the whole net when it comes to trying to scarf for talent, being cast very wide. 
even beyond the more traditional avenues, uh, which is why I wanted to change gears a bit and bring you in, Sailesh, and talk to you, because you've got a very, very different and diverse experience, which I found fascinating, with your hardcore breadth of experience in operations. Um, how do you uh, ensure, like uh, Chetan rightly mentioned, you know, parity for everybody, but also try to inform, you know, get this uniformity across people who are spread over such a very, very large um, geography in terms of roles, in terms of professions. How do you get that uniformity and uh, while even broadening your search for talent? Thank you. So thanks, Karan. So I think everybody spoke about employees, people, culture, and I think that's a big piece because even in Chandler, we are into lifts and escalators. Now, you can't imagine a lift breaking down either in a building or an airport. So while the manufacturing setup is in Pune, we have huge amount of workforce at on the field. Uh, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. And uh, when I talk about, uh, in fact, many times I get a question, are you a B2B, B2C industry? Every time my answer is, we are H2H. To H. It's human to human, it's heart to heart. Because I feel whether it's a customer, whether it's your team, whether it's your manager, if you're able to touch the cord of the people's heart, if you can bring in the purpose, why we are doing, what we are doing, and how we are doing, I think if we achieve that, 90% of the work is done. So we have many internal programs like Schindler Talent Radar, Schindler Career Development Program, which is global. I think we are able to retain good amount of talent, but by giving them in this purpose in the company and by monitoring, by handholding, providing them good induction, I think we are able to retain the talent what we have in the company so far. Thank you. Um, purpose is a word that's been used, again, a lot in the past few years, purpose, meaningfulness, however you want to look at it. Uh, to you, uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar, I just want to uh, ask of you, let me try and flip that question a little bit. You know, you talk about employees trying to find uh, this purpose and seeking it from the company. But when it comes from the, the leadership side of things, you know, um, even leaders for that matter need to create these new uh, mental muscles, so to say, when it comes to being more empathetic, when it comes to the way they treat uh, their workforce or they view their workforce compared to how it has been historically. So then what are those uh, new uh, muscles or those new avenues that they need to be aware of? Good morning. Uh, I think I'm, I come across the least of the manufacturing part from here, but because we don't get into the hard part of it. But in terms of the question you asked, we do a lot of things when you hire somebody fresh from the campus or something. So the initial one week, 10 days is always the you know, honeymoon period. But how do we tackle beyond that? So uh, it's like I was there in one of my plants yesterday. So the conversation was we have you know uh, three or four categories of employees. When we talk about people, we have people who are on the payroll of the company. Then we have a set of people who are on contract employment. And then we have a set of people who are coming on a daily labor base. So the mass is say around 1,200 people of which maybe 300 are the people who are actually sitting on the company payroll. So my thrust was, we have had this, uh, you know, the seniors or the, uh, uh, they are already there, they know how to tackle people, they train the people downstairs. But we have a lot of freshers who come in, and they also become managers from day one because there are people under them. So we have had cases where, you know, they, the behavior from them to the down the line, that, that the people there, that, ta that is something which is needing tackling today. So that is one conversation I had yesterday, the whole day with our, my leaders, because you are good with your people, are the juniors, because they need to also imbibe that culture. So that's one change which I'm looking at within my organization. You know, you, the, the people who are there, my environment is the complete number of people there. It is not just the people I had from campus. I've had 100 people from the village down there. So how do we build that? So that building can only happen if you have that connectivity across. So I think a lot of organizations might may be missing that part of the story because uh, that's something which I feel as a new, you know, next step, I would like to have that being taken care of. Because you have a, a huge number of population of employees who are coming on a daily basis. They are not there working with you for one year or two year or five year. They might be working with you for one month, two months. Are you taking care of them as well when you come to them back? So this is one new thrust I, I'm pursuing in my own organization. That's an important point as well, a fascinating aspect where you've got these daily workers and they also have to be taken along on your journey of growth. Um, uh, Pooja, I wanted to bring you in uh, over here. Uh, we were speaking earlier and you spoke about, I think, five plants, I think it is, in Baramati. 
looking at diverse things. You're talking about the three-wheeler section, the EV section, your engine section, and uh, your spare parts division, all of them. Um, and of course, the fact that you've got about 10% of your workforce uh, being women. Um, when you're looking to build the workforce of the future, right? Uh, what then are you looking at? What are you asking of uh, your teams as you're looking to try and uh, deepen this whole uh, connectivity like uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar alluded to very correctly that you've got to get everybody along. So how do you, you know, take everybody along on this journey of growth? All right, so what we're trying to do is you rightly mentioned, you know, everybody said that the manufacturing is gonna be contributing too much, it's growing. It's also evolving, and, and I think there's a lot of transformation. So for my organization, we were a traditionally IC segment, and now we're moving into EV, and there's a whole lot of difference in the skills, in the mindset, et cetera. So what we've tried doing is, though we know that there are certain traditional jobs which are gonna be actually taken over by uh, machine, right? So what do we do is we look into those positions which are actually gonna be creating value for the organization. And at Piaggio, we have this exercise that we've do been doing for the past three years that's creating readiness for the organization for the future. And it takes time. It cannot be done like a strategy uh, document, six months on the paper and you see the result. It does take time, it, it requires reiterations, it requires a lot of discussions. So what we've done at Piaggio is over the past three years, we've identified certain critical positions based on the value that they're gonna create for the business. So it's not just about how the positions are catering today. How are they achieving their goals? What are they doing? But actually from the future perspective. So those are, those are the critical positions that we would want to invest into. And secondly, what we've done is we've also tried to identify people from the niche skills or from the skills perspective, which is soon gonna be redundant and they need to maybe reskill themselves. If they want to survive, they have to reskill. And there are some of the talents which might just want to go upskilling so that they are geared for the future. And that's about the critical people piece. Now, when you want to put them together, we, we move from the traditional classroom training, et cetera, where there's more of a push. We wanted to create an environment that's more of a pull. And today, what people are looking at is something that they can craft by themselves. They don't want to be pull, pushed into uh, something created for them, but they want to self-design it. So we've actually moved the entire training and development, people development piece from a classroom to uh, which is like an open source where people can actually craft their own learning journeys. They can interact when, anywhere, anytime. They can, they can learn whatever they wish to learn, not what we want them to learn, but keeping it very clear what the organization's vision is and where the organization's future is moving. So that they are very clear as to whether they want to upskill themselves or they want to reskill themselves and what is it they look, or they can you know, look forward in the organization. So I think these two pieces go together. So the transformation doesn't happen, like I said, overnight. It's a journey that gets covered. And there are interventions put together besides the fact that uh, you have a lot of other initiatives for engagement piece, retention piece that you need to have. You need to have the uh, young talent pipelines. You need to have high potential development. You need instant gratification and delayed gratification. That's another piece that we work very uh, you know, rigorously. There are a few things that are that require instant gratification piece. You know, people are looking forward and they want it then and there. And there are a few things, if you want people to stick with the organization, try to have it like fulfilled as a delayed gratification. So, you know, you can have in interventions which can fulfill both. So people stick around with you for a longer period of time. At the same time, they're looking forward to actually upskill themselves and remain as a future with the organization. Uh, when you said that people are looking to craft their own journeys, that's something that really spoke to me. Because um, everybody has, um, they're, they're the main character of their own stories, aren't they? And they're all looking to try and get ahead in life, build a better future, not just for themselves, but for their loved ones, to try and uh, leave something behind that's worth something. Uh, Mr. Mohit Kumar, I wanted to address my next question to you, because I want to just pick up that uh, riff on that particular thread over there. Um, like uh, Pooja rightly mentioned, everybody's very engaged, very invested in creating this lifelong journey of growth, of learning for themselves. Uh, so then how do you uh, set that ball rolling in motion? Uh, how do you create these learning and development pathways for, uh, for the workforce? Oh, thank you, a wonderful question. Uh, 
so learning uh, the role of uh, uh, the organization is to create the ecosystem for learning and that gets built by the leaders in the organization right so as we are talking uh, our leaders are here in this room uh, our ceo for the copper business rohit is here uh, chief equipment officer kopal is here hr head for copper business vinita is here that shows the level of involvement with the people agenda with the learning agenda so when i was talking about the program which is fit for future by design for the future cxos right so current cxos they get involved in terms of mentoring them coaching them so it is not only about giving feedback it's about working with them and ensuring that they take up the roles which are envisaged for them and that kind of uh, um, culture the learning culture gets passed on from one level to the next level so this group of people create the next level of leaders in the other programs which are lined up for the middle management which we call say leading from the middle or for the first time managers which we call future leader in you uh, so this, those kind of uh, the, the culture of coaching mentoring that creates the environment for learning uh, the typical uh, 70s to 20s to 10 model so just the environment for learning is not uh, enough as pooja was talking about people need to choose what they want to learn so we have uh, open projects right that people can work across uh, hindalco in different businesses of hindalco in different businesses of iit bilda group because uh, this is, uh, hindalco is part of larger iit bilda group that adds to their experiential learning learning from different leaders yeah uh, learning on different uh, uh, projects which can be uh, augmenting the current skill set that they have in case somebody is great at business skill business leadership the augmentation can be on the people leadership or suppose somebody is great at business leadership and the people leadership the augmentation can be on the self awareness and the self leadership yeah and so on so on yeah so that's a 70 piece that is on the projects so different thing uh, the, the learning communities we have uh, hindalco technical university where we have uh, schools of refinery schools of power schools of smelter uh, so uh, schools of school of mining the experts of those communities are part of that uh, school and mm, through interaction uh, inside the organization outside the organization they able to learn uh, the the contemporary and the latest in those fields so it's like 70s to 20s to 10 10 10 part i mentioned in the last uh, uh, question that we have programs for every level so that's the journey which gets enabled by our leaders personally leading that uh, uh, journey role modeling the journey also and they are also learning every day new skills required for uh, them so that's the learning culture which gets built in life uh, really is a learning journey for all of us no matter where we are in our professional career or in our personal journey so to speak uh, let me let me try and change things up a bit and throw a question to you sirish because i think you are the perhaps the best person to answer this particular question more than anybody else on this panel um, we've seen uh, so many work models emerge over the past few years you know whether it's on site or fully off site a mix of the two i think any company has to make their own success model so to speak um but what does this mean for the real estate footprint you know of organizations is this something that you see a sustaining will it change or how do you see that playing out so absolutely in fact post covid era we have seen a huge change in the people's mind as well as on the from the organizational point of view like before maybe uh, the the ctc part or the what you are getting in hand was the most important part for employees nowadays i think they know the priorities they are able to prioritize well so what is that also so that is not the only thing for them to drive they are looking for something else the, so the priorities are changing also like we were talking about the young people joining maybe they are not used to this 9 to 5 30 culture they want that flexibility they want the uh, locational preference where they can operate so that's also another demand which is coming to and the third part which i see also the technology part which is also growing rapidly with kind of our kind of industry like you know typically when i talk about lift escalator when there's a breakdown people used to call the call center then the technician will come attend the breakdown this was the model which we used to call preventive maintenance now we are going to the predictive maintenance part so we have certain devices in the lift in the shaft which can predict that maybe after two days something is going to go wrong so there i think we are getting the advanced intimation which is helping the life of the elevator more robust and the downtime is very minimum uh, the advertising space in fact i feel the way do you see the digital media screen inside the cabin or on the doors i think maybe after 10 years we will by the way sell elevator so these are all things which are evolving 
and I think we are getting ready for it. Yeah. Fascinating uh, points over there, perspectives over there, Sailesh. Um, my question I wanted to pose uh, to you, Mr. Mohit, is particularly um, when it comes to all of these um, changes that we see, you know, we're talking about trying to embrace this new change and this and that technology, automation, AR, AI, as the case may be. But uh, Bajaj, of course, has a massive, massive history when it comes to uh, being a brand in the Indian mind space uh, and in the industry landscape, of course. But um, what do you think we need to hang on to, you know, even as we step into this brave new future? There, there are certainly some good things over there to be held on to. So I think uh, an answer to in introspect, because you don't have a right answer to give right away about it. But uh, if you really need, need to look at what you need to hang on to, I would say you need to hang on to only one thing. That's embracing change. <laughs> that is what will keep you going and moving on. But still, to substantiate it further, I would look at five key tenants which are very important for the organization or businesses to run through. So one, <laughs> culture, which we all spoke of. And like all my panelists and members here said, culture is not something that will come overnight. So organizations, are they driven, driven with a strong purpose? Do we get employees in the organization who associate with us and then look at the longer picture and have a purpose to feel proud of? That's one thing which organizations need to constantly work upon. How am I impacting my lives of people within the organization and beyond the organization? So community becomes one more very important facet of an organization when you work into how am I impacting lives of individuals, lives of communities, people, villages, towns around me? Am I a part of it? And that gives me a sense of pride. Third, one very important thing, like what uh, all my colleagues said, Sanjay said, and Mohit said, career is, it's not about jobs which people are looking at. If you want to uh, get them glued to the organization, you need to show them a career path. You need to give them a journey. That You've come here and with all the streams of uh, working, the STEM, you can move up the career progression ladder and today you join the organization, two decades down the line, you could speak to your kids, I head this organization. That gives a sense of pride and we need to bring in that culture back into the manufacturing. Fourth, very important facet in organizations today, which needs to continue, communication. There's a lot of communication all across. You have a lot of social media penetrating into our lives also because of the kind of generations we have and technology which has come in. But communication needs to be meaningful. How do we create a communication, a web of communication around what the organization is doing? An individual in the organization at the bottom most level today is actually devoid of all the developments which are happening across the organization. So within Bajaj, we have a very strong corporate communications group which actually creates a very nice storyline around what's happening across all the different entities. What do people feel about it? Why do they have passion about being here? Why have they stuck around here? What's making the difference for them? When you hear stories like that, you are passionately driven that there's something good here. I can't leave this place. I need to be here. I need to be that one guy who's speaking my story in there. That is one thing. And last but not the least, comfort. We know that we've seen the COVID era, we've seen the pre and the post COVID, a lot of things have changed in the entire industry, in the workspace, in the landscape. A lot of companies had laid off people, a lot of people lost their lives, lost their jobs. But then one thing which stayed across with some of the beautiful organizations, they took care of their employees. They ensured that there were no layoffs. They ensured that when they spoke of employees, it was not just the uh, full-time employees who were on roles with the company, but the third-party workers and the contract workers who were very beautifully managed within the organization, created social bubbles, took care of their health and mediclaims, took care of their livelihoods, and also, in the toughest time, gave increments to those people and said that you are valuable and this is the time we care for you. So with that kind of a culture, the five C's which I spoke of, which is all about the community feeling, the culture, the career, the comfort, and the communication. This is something which organizations need to hang on to, and I think we'll make manufacturing a desired place to work for in the coming future, for sure, with all the technology inputs as well. 
Fascinating. Very, very well put, uh, Mr. Mohit Saxena. Um, as we come towards the end of these entire discussions, I'll just uh, try to get a few perspectives in now, even though the timer's telling me that I need to exit the stage pronto. But nevertheless, uh, my question to you, uh, Mr. Shivakumar, is um, there are these opportunities that are there before us. Sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I was just saying that there are these opportunities that are there before us, you know, when it comes to trying to um, care for the community, like uh, Mr. Saxena said just now, that trying to give it back, trying to uh, embed this culture of care across the continuum. Uh, what are the kind of opportunities that pop out to your mind? Uh, or perhaps what are the capabilities that need to be strengthened? I think uh, the lessons we learned during the first wave of the pandemic, I think that's been a great lesson for all of us. Because I, we were in a sector which was uh, the essential, so we never had a work from home throughout that entire period. So the first one week, and I think uh, the remote locations, because uh, we, I was sitting here, but my team or the people who were sitting at the far locations, I think within the first one week itself, they managed to come to terms with that and manage the work. So that involved, uh, you know, for us, the learning was, the involvement was not the workers who were coming inside, because we learned that we need to also take care of these people are going outside. So we had to go outside our perimeter to take care of the community around us. I think, and that happened at three or four locations because, because the people are coming and interacting with the people who are over there. So what we did, we went around the sanitization around the schools, the uh, villages, uh, and the people, things set up there, get into uh, distribution of food and ration part of it. So, and this was not just done by the CSR department or the HR department. It happened with the involvement of the entire workforce with, within the premises. So, I think these are the learnings which we learned, and I think going forward, those will be in good stand for us. You know, we have learned it, and even if a next wave comes in, I think we are prepared. I think that's the, that's the lesson. We will not face the same difficulties and same challenges because we have learned from our past, and that will be uh, helping us get taking it forward. I think that's what it all boils down to at the end of the day. You really can't uh, repeat the mistakes you made in the past. To make a mistake is fine, but to repeat the same mistake, I think, is perhaps the cardinal sin. Uh, I'm going to leave it uh, with you, Chetan, with the final word in this particular panel. Um, we've seen some very uh, high-profile examples of how collaboration is now seeping in, even into the manufacturing industry when it comes to technology. Uh, some mandates for days in the office, on-site, off-site, as the case may be. Um, how do you see these uh, playing out, so to speak? What other uh, tactics would you then recommend to kind of consider in the short to medium term over, the, say, the next four or five years? Yeah, so I, you are dead right. I think there is a level playing field happening in, in manufacturing. You know, all, all the things that apply to any best place work, uh, irrespective of the industry, is also being practiced in manufacturing. and. The, the major driver, as uh, most of them uh, mentioned, is the connecting factor is technology. I think the technology is one element which makes us on a playing level playing field with any other industries. So I think a lot of uh, uh, advancements are happening in our industry itself, which uh, ch is changing the culture within the manufacturing organization itself, right? I mean. People are aspiring to look at these buzzwords, not just from a knowledge perspective, but from a execution perspective. So they all want to understand how their future is going to look like, you know, machine learning, AI, industry 4.0, smart plants. So that is driving a, a different need of culture within manufacturing places, uh, especially in the middle of the pyramid. Uh, I think the bottom of the pyramid is also catching up. So I think the future challenge is how do we coexist when when the uh, the the demands of the consumers will increase um, the volumes will increase and when the volumes will increase you need to go for automation but yet uh, being in the middle of the pyramid or sometimes in the top of the pyramid how do you coexist with machines i think that is dr driving a different kind of learning culture uh, it is paving waves uh, I see a lot of people uh, now going back to universities in the middle uh, or going to specialist short-term courses to upgrade themselves uh, on, on technology front itself, leave alone the management and the managerial skills. So that's driving a lot of hunger. Now with the influx of new guys coming also, which is uh, firing up the 
the culture all together. I think more and more uh, exposure will only make sure that uh, we are on par with any other industry. So the middle of the pyramid and the top of the pyramid of manufacturing will exactly look similar to any other industry, whether it is a BFSI, IT, because ultimately th uh, the IQ and EQ levels will go up. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, every industry is about how do you uh, make money, how do you make uh, customers happy. So I think the same applies to manufacturing as well. So it, I think it's shaping up well. Uh, I see the, the shop floors being more modern, uh, cleaner, um, uh, the, the cafeterias, all these things that gives you a, a hint of culture are you know, upping their ante. Uh, and then there is technology as a lever. So it, it should augur well for future. No, I think that's my big takeaway from this, that those three Ps matter when it comes to profitability, of course, but also purpose, also people, and then three Cs in terms of compassion, in terms of care, in terms of nurturing a culture. These are all things that uh, all of us can aspire to, look to learn from, and I hope that you found uh, all of these discussions with our eminent panelists to be most fascinating, and that has provided you some kind of a strategic roadmap going ahead for your own organizations. Uh, thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. That's about all the time we have. And I encourage, again, all of you to please uh, feel free to chat with our panelists off stage if you also feel like it. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Karan Karai. Uh, our speakers right here, I think some absolutely brilliant points that came from each of them. So please do put your hands together as we thank all of you all for joining us. And may I once again request Mr. Gupta Nani to please join us on stage and uh, really thank all our speakers for sharing with us what they've been doing at their organizations. And like Karan just mentioned, uh, he put together all the key takeaways uh, for us. It is really, of course, we're all working for profit. So we really have to consider that. But at the end of the day, really putting the people together and at the top of our minds right there. So let me now request Mr. Gupta Nani to please thank uh, each of our speakers, our panelists right here with uh, a speaker certificate and uh, let us appreciate your presence. Uh, once again, let's hear it up for Mr. Chetan Deshpande. We thank you, sir, for joining us and, of course, for sharing your uh, views. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mr. Krishna Kumar, Mr. Mohit Kumar, Mr. Mohit Saxena, of course, uh, Ms. Pooja Bansal for sharing her thoughts here with us. Uh, Mr. Shailesh Vilankar and our moderator, Mr. Karai, really for putting together all these uh, thoughts. Uh, of course, like he mentioned, all those of you who would like to converse on a one-on-one -on -one with our panelists, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to chat with you later during our networking lunch. We still have a lot more action that's going to happen right here, so please do stay tuned for that. Very soon, we're going to talk about our next segment, which is going to be a very interesting conversation that I'm sure a lot of you have had in your organizations because we have all sort of age groups come together to work towards one big major goal but telling you a lot about it in just a bit let me till then encourage all of you to please head to your social media accounts uh, join in the conversation share with your friends uh, what we're discussing right here and how uh, we can get inputs from them on being the most preferred workplace especially when it comes to the manufacturing sector do remember to tag us using our hashtag preferred workplaces once again thanking each of you for joining in uh, may i request all of you to please step further ahead uh, for a group picture we'd love to have all of you in the same frame please and a uh, round of applause from our kind audience please can we please have microphone one on cordless one <laughs>